من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد I would begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide. And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is Abdullah, he is the servant, the worshipper of Allah, and he is the messenger of Allah. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the topic that I have chosen to talk about today is dawa or destruction. It is one of the things that I have observed throughout the 15 years or 16 years that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, has blessed me with this guidance of Islam. One of the things that I have observed is that the Muslims have not given the issue of da'wah it's due attention. And by the way here, I mean something very specific by the way. I don't mean uh, dawa in its most broad and general meaning. I mean something very specific. Here I am talking about the duty and the obligation to call the non-Muslims to Islam. So this is what I am specifically talking about. And I have found that by and large, Muslims have neglected their duty in this regard. But let's not deal with everybody else. Let's deal with the brothers and sisters sitting in this room right here, right now, today. I don't want us to think about anyone else. I want you to think about you. I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think, or perhaps if you've got a piece of paper and a pen, which would be a good idea in a two-day conference if you're coming to take notes. Yes? Didn't anyone bring pen and paper to take notes? MashaAllah, one sister, one brother, Alhamdulillah, two people, MashaAllah. This is what you should be doing. I mean, I don't care about my lecture, but I know some of the brothers here who are going to be giving lectures, you should be taking notes on what they're saying. My lecture, hopefully I'm going to imprint it in your mind. <laughs> okay, brothers and sisters. Dawa. How much dawa have you done this week? How many non-Muslims have you talked to about Islam? This week. Think about it. I mean, this week when the leader of the British National Party called Islam a wicked and evil religion. When the Daily Mail published an article, one of its journalists, he said, I'm going to attack Islam while I still can. And he said the same thing. He basically went on to say that Islam is vile and wicked and evil religion. And interestingly enough, he didn't actually quote any passages from the Quran. But his proof of the wickedness and vileness of Islam was the behavior of some Muslims. How he himself observed how some Asian youth called a woman scout leader, Christian bitch. This is his observation. Uh, including some other things, that's the thing that stuck in my mind, perhaps for an obvious reason, including some other observations that he had about the activities and the behavior of Muslims. So brothers and sisters, mashallah, with our hats and thobes and beards and hijabs and niqabs. How much dawah have you done this week? How many non-Muslims have you talked to about Islam? What effort and attempt have you made to clear up these misconceptions, these lies? Or, my brothers and sisters, have you actually just added to it? 
Have you just been another person who has let those people walk away and think, yeah, that stuff I thought about Islam, I met one of those Muslims and it was just like what they said. Think about it. And we should not imagine that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to ask us about. I mean, most of us must have heard, I imagine the brothers and sisters looking around, who, have come, who are coming to these conferences and who are sitting here today, must have heard so many times, if you haven't heard it from me, you must have heard it from the various shayukh that have come to this country about the importance of giving dawah. In fact, many of you must know, many of you must know, what many of the, the, the scholars have said that in fact one of the only reasons we are even allowed to be in this country is to give dawah. I mean, I'm not going to discuss this issue whether it's correct or not and it's not my intention to bring up the issue of hijrah but it is enough to emphasize this constant theme that has been mentioned again and again and again and again, over and over. Don't you know that knowledge is something you're going to be asked about? Not the information you've got in your brain, but what action resulted from that knowledge? Our two feet will not stand, will not move from its place in front of Allah. The two feet of the son of Adam will not move from their place in front of Allah until he asks us about five things. Our life, how we spent it. Our youth, or in another narration, our health and how we cared for it. Our money, how we earned it and how we spent it and your knowledge and how you acted upon it. Your knowledge and how you acted upon it. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we accumulate a lot of knowledge. But how much of it do we actually act upon? Here is a simple piece of knowledge. If we don't know the knowledge base for giving dawah, let's just remind ourselves of some of the ayat, some of the sayings of the Prophet wasallam, some of the consequences of failing to fulfill this obligation. That's why I call this talk dawah or destruction, because that is what is going to happen. Either we give dawah or we will be destroyed. That is the option. Either we call to Allah and we invite to His deen, or Allah Himself will humiliate us and He will destroy us. This is the fact. The fact that is proven by what Allah and His Messenger have said. The first example I would like to give is a story. Not a story in the sense of a fairy story, a true story. Let's actually better phrase it, history. This is true history. This is mentioned in the Qur'an. The Qur'an, alhamdulillah, is a book that has many qualities, many excellent qualities. And one of its excellent qualities is that it tells us history. But this history is for a purpose, brothers and sisters. The history, the purpose of this history is to remind us of what happened before to the people before in the times before and to point out their mistakes and errors so that we do not fall into the same mistakes and the same errors that we take a lesson we should learn the lesson of history this unfortunately is something we very rarely seem to be able to do so here's a piece of history there was a nation that came before us. They were a nation to whom Allah sent them messengers. Indeed, Allah favored them above all other people. Allah favored them above all other people. They were the Bani Israel. The descendants, the children of Israel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them messengers. And amongst these people, 
the Bani Israel. One, there was a village. And this village was located by the sea. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about this history in the Quran. About this village that is located by the sea. And this village used to take or used to make their livelihood from fishing. From fishing. But these people began to commit sins. So when people begin to commit sins, what is the consequence of that? What is the consequence of committing sins? What is one of the consequences of committing sins? Allah sends upon you a fitna, a trial, a test, a tribulation. So Allah sent these people a test. This is the fitna that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them. He tested them with something because of their sins. Every single day, they used to go out in their boats and find no fish in the water. Except on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, which is the one day in the week they are not allowed to do any work. They are prohibited from working on the Sabbath. But on the Sabbath day, the fish would appear in the sea. According to some explanations, this, the fish would be jumping out of the sea. The sea would be full of fish. Now brothers and sisters, don't you think maybe that if this happened like once, you may think it's a coincidence. If it happened twice, you might begin to think, wait a minute, something's going on here. If it happens three, four, five times in a row, and every time you go to the sea you're not catching anything, and the one day you're not allowed to catch the fish, the fish appear, surely a person is going to start thinking, Allah's trying to tell me something here. Surely. It's like a sign to make you realize. Anyway, this village was divided into three different groups of people. Group A, they devised a cunning plan, or as it was in their mind, a cunning plan. What they decided to do was to lay the nets, to lay the nets to catch the fish the night before the Sabbath. So the Sabbath, like our day in Islam, starts at Maghrib. So just before Maghrib, on the Friday, so Friday evening, just before Maghrib, Friday afternoon, they would lay the nets. Then they would wait until just after Maghrib on Saturday, and then they would collect all the fish. And they'd say, you see, we didn't actually do any work on the Sabbath. We did the work the evening before, and we did the work the evening after, and so we didn't actually transgress the Sabbath. This is according to one explanation of the, the, the Mufassirun, this is what they said. So this was the group. In fact, of course, brothers and sisters, they were breaking the Sabbath. They were still causing fish to be caught on the Sabbath day. And then there was another group of people. This other group of people decided that they must enjoin right and forbid wrong. They went and they started to warn the people who were breaking the Sabbath. They were telling them to fear Allah, to abstain from this evil thing that they were doing. And so they were involved in this process of giving down, Of reminding people to avoid the evil. And then there was a third group. The third group, brothers and sisters, they weren't breaking the Sabbath. They weren't fishing on the Sabbath day. They were going to the masjid, they were saying their prayers, fulfilling their duties and their obligations. But they said to group number two, the ones who are giving dawah, why do you bother? Why do you bother with these people whom Allah is about to destroy? Why are you bothering talking to these people? So they knew that Allah was going to destroy them. They knew the destruction was going to come upon the Sabbath breakers. And they said to the people giving dawah, why do you bother? Why bother with these people? They're going to be destroyed anyway. And so the ones giving dawah, they replied, 
That's two reasons they gave. Number one, maybe they will fear Allah. Maybe they will remember Allah. Maybe they will give up this thing. So number one, maybe they will fear Allah. And the second reason is, so that we will be free in front of our Lord. We will have done our duty. So, they knew and understood that it was their obligation before Allah to remind these people and to try and prevent them from the evil they were doing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions in the Qur'an that He only, or it's implied, that there is only one group that was saved. As you know the story, Allah turned this village into, He turned them into apes. He transformed this village of people into monkeys. That's why, by the way, you hear some people, some Muslims, they often use concerning the, they refer to the Jews as the sons of apes and swine. Ever heard that term being used? About the Yehudis? They call them the sons of the apes and swine. Anyway, in another, there is some hadith that also says that they were turned into apes and pigs. So this is where they get that from. They had the descendants of these people who were turned into apes and pigs. In other words, this is their characteristic. This is what happened to these people. Sons of apes and swine. So this is what Allah turned them. But there is one group only that Allah mentioned that He rescued. Allah mentioned in the Qur'an that we saved those who forbade wrong. We saved those who forbade wrong. And we destroyed the wrongdoers. The only people that were rescued were the ones who were involved in trying to change the evil. Those people who went to the masjid, they didn't break the Sabbath, they minded their own business. That third group that we're talking about, they were transformed along with the others. And this fits, my brothers and sisters, what the Prophet ﷺ said in general. He warned us in a narration where he said that you must enjoy what is right and forbid what is wrong. You must do it. Or else Allah will send upon you a calamity. Allah will send upon you a calamity. And you will make dua, you will supplicate to Allah, and your supplications will not be accepted. This is why you may read in some of the books that talk about the causes for supplication to be answered and the causes for supplication to be rejected. You will find that they mention that one of the causes for a supplication not to be answered is when people cease enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong. Allah will send upon you a calamity. Allah will send upon you a calamity. And you will ask, Allah, save me, save us, rescue us. But Allah will not respond to the supplication. So brothers and sisters, when we see evil, it is upon us to try and change it. When we see evil, it is upon us to try and change it. If you see an evil, you should change it with your hands. If you cannot change it with your hands, then change it with your tongue. And if you can't change it with your tongue, at least hate it in your heart. And that is the weakest form of faith. That is the weakest form of faith. So when we see evil, it is upon us brothers and sisters that we must do something to try and change it. And we are surrounded by evil. We are surrounded by the greatest evil, which is the disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The rejection of Allah and His deen. And it is upon us, the people to whom Allah has given the guidance, the Qur'an. He has given us the example of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are the ones, my brothers and sisters, who have been given that knowledge and that guidance. And it is upon us and it is our duty and our obligation in order to convey that message to others. And when we abandon this struggle to make Allah's word the highest, then there is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will humiliate us. He will make us a feast for our enemies. He will make our enemies no longer afraid of us. 
and our hearts will become full of elevation, wahan, love of life, and fear of death. As the Prophet ﷺ mentioned these things. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned the time when we will be many, like the foam on the sea. So many. 1.6 billion human beings are Muslim. One fifth of the earth's population. 1.6 billion. We're the fastest growing religion in the world. More people are converting to Islam than any other religion. MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah. But 1.6 billion people? But we can't do anything. What can we do? Nothing. It's pathetic. I remember, brothers and sisters, many years ago, well, it was subhanAllah, when I first became Muslim, so about 14 years ago, alhamdulillah, I made Hajj. And I'd seen on the TV, you know, and on the video and stuff like that, that when the call to prayer comes, you know when everyone's making tawaf, especially at Hajj time, everyone's making tawaf, the whole inner courtyard of the Kaaba is this mass of people going around the Kaaba. And then when the Adhan goes, that, that, mass of, that mass of people gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you've just got a few more people going around the Kaaba and then just before the prayer it stops. And I, it, I don't know, it's just something that I wanted to see it. So I went to the top level, the, you know, the very high balcony, and I was looking over and the Adhan came and I was watching this, you know, this amazing spectacle to me. I just wanted to see it. And there was this guy standing next to me, a brother, alhamdulillah, I think he was Egyptian. I was going, mashallah, you know, where are you from, brother? I'm from England. And he was saying, isn't this beautiful? Look at all the Muslims. And I looked, I looked. And uh, I looked at him and I said, no, really, it makes me sad. He said, astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah, he goes, how can it make you sad? I said, because you know, when I look at this, I remember the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he said, there will come a time when your enemies will make a feast of you. In the same way that you invite people to share from a feast, the enemies will take from you. I said, and the Prophet mentioned that we will be many like the foam on the sea. And it was. The foam on the sea is what color? Have you seen the foam on the sea? The foam is white. So I saw all these people dressed in white, like the foam on the sea, it reminded me. And I thought, all these Muslims, millions and millions of Muslims, Palestine is still occupied, Afghanistan at that time was still occupied, Kashmir was still occupied, the Muslims were in abject humiliation. And I thought, there's so many of us, look at everybody here. Yet what is it? We're like the foam on the sea. Like bubbles of no real substance. Because what? The reality is, we have abandoned this struggle to make Allah's word the highest. In fact, perhaps you only have to be a convert to Islam to actually have experienced the actual strangeness with which you are greeted sometimes. As if people, I mean, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, it doesn't happen that much. But when I first became Muslim, there weren't that many white Muslims. And sometimes it was like, what are you doing? You know, and still you, you, still you get it sometimes. You get, you know, uh, not me, no one's actually said this to me, but a friend of mine, someone said to you, someone said to my friend of mine, he walked into the mosque, he said, what are you doing here? Go to your Gora place. He said, go to the Gora place. Don't you have your own Gora God? That Jesus, your God? You go and pray to Him. <gasps> this is where we worship Allah, the Pakistani God. This is what he was told by a, a boy. I mean, we laugh, brothers and sisters, but it's really not funny. I mean, alhamdulillah, the brother was well established in his deen, so he wasn't intimidated. But what if someone wasn't? What if someone had just come to find out about Islam? That's your children. That's my, our children. Our brothers and sisters. Because someone has not educated their child properly. Because someone has this attitude that Islam is a Pakistani religion. Or a 
it's a Saudi religion or a Bengali or Moroccan religion. When you've become Muslim, people think, oh, he's become a Pakistani. Yes, because some people don't seem to know the difference. And then also we expected, what, to wear shawal kameez or wear a thawb and look like an Arab or a Pakistani. I, why? I'm not in Saudi Arabia, I'm not in Pakistan. It's very strange. What, what dawah is this, brothers and sisters? What sort of invitation to Islam is this? How is this going to facilitate us calling these people to the religion of Islam? We don't even have this mentality. I mean, alhamdulillah, there are people, many brothers and sisters, who do at least have the understanding. But where's the action? Where is the actual action? Where is the actual going out, making the efforts, talking to people? And I don't mean necessarily. I mean, there should be a whole range of activities. There should be. There's so many ways of giving dawah. One can, from, you know, going and speaking to people, knocking on their doors, why not? People say, oh, the Jehovah's Witnesses do it. So? So what? If they do it. What's wrong with going and knocking? We used to do that. I remember down in Brixton, we thought, let's try it. And one guy, he said to us, he said, well, I've had the Jehovah's Witnesses, I've had the Mormons. I've had these people, well, I'm glad that a Muslim's come to tell me about his religion. We'll come in and we'll have a chat. He was really happy. Why not? What's wrong with it? You know, it's free. No one's going to take you and torture you yet. Yet. For knocking on a door and telling people about Islam. No one in this country yet is going to take you and put you in prison, torture you. In fact, in fact, you have a right. You are protected by law to be able to peacefully go and propagate the religion of Islam. Not like the Sahaba in the time of the Prophet when they were in Mecca. If they went down to the Kaaba and they announced their Islam, they would get beaten half to death. They had to pray in secret because they were so afraid. They had to go and they found a valley and a place outside to go and pray. And they used to have to gather in Dar al Arkan because they were afraid of what would happen to them. And as you know, some of the Muslims were so to badly tortured. Bilal, how what happened to him? How he was dragged on the sand and pinned down and hot coals were put on his back until he could smell the fat cooking on his back. Forcing him to worship idols and he said, Ahad, Ahad, it's not going to happen to you, not in this country. But we can't even have the courage to go and talk to people and let them know about what Islam really is. Subhanallah. No wonder we're humiliated. No wonder. Because we have a humiliated mentality. We have a defeated mind. We feel inferior. We don't feel that Islam is the true religion. We don't feel that this is the true way for mankind. Like the Sahaba, that's what they believed and they were ready to die for it, brothers and sisters. Look how they suffered. But you and me, what do we do? Who is better in speech? Who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah and says, I am a Muslim? Whose speech is better? And so it's not just about good character. It's not. Some people say, yes, I give dawah through good character. Well, alhamdulillah, I don't want to belittle that. Absolutely not. It is very, very important. It is very important. It's a great dawah. But I am afraid that brothers and sisters make it a big excuse. Number one, most of us don't have that good character anyway. Let's be honest. We don't have the sort of good character that is the type of character that's going to make people become Muslim. That's the first thing. And secondly, it becomes an excuse. Well, I'm not going to talk to him because I'm displaying good character. No, but this piece of person needs to be talked to. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, who is better in speech? Who is better than the one who says? Who calls to Allah and says, I am a Muslim? This is the best of speech, brothers and sisters, calling to Allah. 
calling to Allah. And this, by the way, is our da'wah. Our da'wah is to Allah. Our call is to Allah. It is not to a sect. It's not to a group. It's not to a culture. We are calling to Allah, to La ilaha illallah, to call the people to worship Allah alone. We're not calling them, as some people think, to give up smoking or give up drinking or give up homosexuality. Of course, these things are all forbidden in Islam. That is one of the consequences, inshallah. They will give those things up. But we shouldn't mistake our dawah does not begin with, oh, homosexuality is bad, such and such drinking and out. No, we don't eat pig. And when you become Muslim, you've got to get circumcised. I mean, this, some people think this is the dawah. Or some people get so confused. I remember there's a famous story where a man who really wanted to become Muslim. So he went to some brothers and he said to them, I'd love to become Muslim, but I've only got one question. Do I have to eat curry? I want to become Muslim, but do I have to eat curry? This confusion should not be there. We should at least not facilitate that confusion. I mean, some people, they just get these ideas for themselves. But my point is, our dawah is not to a culture, a particular culture, that yes, of course, it's influenced or strongly molded by Islam. But our dawah is to Allah, is to worship Allah alone, to give up shirk. This is where it all begins. If we understand that method as well, we will, understand, we will begin to realize how should we give this dawah. Because anyway, we don't have time at all to talk about that. How do we give dawah? How should we go about it? You know, this is something that really demands a type of proper conference, seminar, discussions that deal particularly with this topic. And it's something we need to learn how to do. It's a skill. It's a skill. It's an art form. Maybe that's not the correct type of term, but it, it is. It's a skill and you can learn it. You don't have to do, be doing it for 15 years. You can learn it. You can learn from people who have been giving dawah. You can learn the things to say, the things not to say. How to approach this person, how to approach this type of person. It's, it, you can learn these things and one should, one must. Because as you know, brothers and sisters, in Islam, knowledge precedes action. We should not be like those people who are full of enthusiasm but ignorant. Let us be full of enthusiasm and knowledgeable. Because unfortunately what we see is sometimes we have people that have got knowledge, but for some reason they don't have the enthusiasm. I, I don't know. They got the knowledge, but the enthusiasm, enthusiasm, is, enthusiasm is not there. And we find, mashallah, people with lots of enthusiasm, but not, not so much knowledge. So we do have to be careful in that regard. So this is the importance of, we need to know what to say, what to do, how to give dawah. We need the enthusiasm and we need the knowledge. Brothers and sisters, please. This issue of dawah is very, very important. We should, I don't want us to go away with the, uh, just some jokes in our head. Really, I have said to many brothers and sisters and I say it to you, and I believe this from the bottom of my heart. We either give dawah or we will be destroyed. Either you give dawah brothers and sisters or else I will tell you the fact. There's only two options. Either you are giving dawah or someone is giving you dawah. Either you give dawah or dawah is being given to you. You are either giving it out or you are receiving something. And the dawah, of course, is the dawah of shaitan, the dawah to jahannam, the dawah of materialism, the dawah of Christianity. The dawah of this society. Either you're being invited to follow their way or you're going to invite them to follow our way. It's going to be one or the other. And that doesn't just go for you, it goes for your children. Either they are learning to be da'is or they are being given dawah. Either they are going to be the people who carry the message 
or they are the people who are going to be receiving someone else's message. So if we don't do it, it's only a matter of time. Because bit by bit by bit, our faith will erode, our Islam will erode, our certainty will begin to disintegrate, our conviction will begin to subside, and then we will truly integrate in the way that they want us to integrate. You will not be able to tell a Muslim from a Kafir, except perhaps by his or her name. And then even eventually that will go too. So the concept of Dawah is essential merely just to our survival. Just to our survival here in this land. Because we are not the dominant culture, we are not the dominant mentality. It is only natural that you are going to be influenced and persuaded by that which is dominant. It's natural in the human being. The only way I can think of that you can overcome that is by you yourself becoming strongly involved in challenging these ideas. And you become strongly involved in challenging these ideas in the process of giving down. When you talk to people and they ask you questions, then you need to find out the answer to those questions. And you will come back and you'll be able to respond then to these challenges because you've dealt with them in your everyday experience with people. And I'm sure many of you have many doubts, many shubaha, many uncertainties about Islam and perhaps you've never really had the courage to find out or to voice them to so you could get answers, but you need to. And one of the ways that one learns to do that is through giving dawah. So this destruction, brothers and sisters, may not necessarily come in, you know, a flood or a, you know, a, a famine or, or, you know, something that is obvious, immediate. Destruction can be slow. It can happen slowly, almost imperceptibly. This, it happens both ways. There are many ways that Allah can destroy a people. They're not all dramatic. Not everyone is destroyed with a flood or, or, or you know, with a, with a shout or like Ad and Thalmud or the people of Nuh. No. Some just gradually fall slowly into decline and disintegrate. This is another type of destruction. It happens like that. It's still destruction just the same. So brothers and sisters, my plea with you today is to take this matter seriously. To make an effort. Act on the piece of knowledge. Now you've got a piece of knowledge, you've got a piece of information. Now I want you to translate it into action. I want you to translate it into action. Today. I want you to translate it into action today. Why don't you go and talk to your next door neighbor today? Why don't you give dawah to some old school friend you knew at school today? Maybe some relative you know or some friend of a relative you know who's not a Muslim. There is some way you could give a little bit of dawah today. Don't leave it. Do it today. Act on the piece of knowledge. You know it's knowledge. You know you should do it. Then act on it. Get into that habit of acting on your knowledge. Because if you don't, brothers and sisters, it's a witness against you, not for you. It will be a witness against you on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la ahli wa sahbihi wa sallam. Um, how do you think that should be directed to um, individuals? How do you feel about that in the form of exhibitions, inviting people out in the public and allowing them to see this way? Because for those people who are not able to communicate, whether or not have a few individuals who are inside of the level of communication. I think we need to use every halal method and means that we can in order to spread the message of Islam. Whether it is through the radio, the television, tapes, CDs, through the internet, on PalTalk, um, 
all through exhibitions, all through talking to individuals, all through speeches and lectures. Whatever method we can use and utilize in order to convey the message of Islam, we should use it. I actually believe that in this country, exhibitions work particularly well. Because the mentality of the English people, it's very, it's very in touch with their mentality. The English by and large are conservative people. They don't change their minds about things very easily. And they don't generally like being evangelized to. The British people generally don't like people standing up and evangelizing and you know, hallelujah and you know, like the Americans, they get all very enthusiastic about things. They, you can do that with them. But the English, I think an exhibition is very much suitable to their mentality. The real challenge is how to get them to see the exhibition. This is the challenge. From my experience, um, it's a good idea. If they come, they usually love it. Because they can take their time, they can look around, no one's there to look over their necks and, you know, to be telling them, you know, they, if, the, if, if there should be brothers and sisters there to talk to them, but they love this way of being able to take their time and look at things in their own pace and not to feel that someone is sort of pushing them any which way. And that suits their mentality a lot. And I think this is very important that when we're giving dawah, we do have to understand who we are giving dawah to, the nature of the people we are giving dawah to. To. For example, when the Prophet wasallam sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen, the Prophet told Mu'ad, who are these people? You are going to the people of the book. So he's telling them, look, these, this is these people, so, and then he said, let the first thing you call them to is the oneness of Allah. If they accept that, then get them to pray five times a day. When they've established that, so the Prophet is showing Mu'ad the method here. So he's telling them, who are these people? What is their thinking? And so on and so forth. So this is very, very important. And I think, personally, exhibitions are an excellent way. Uh, of of being of giving dawah, especially to the to the English, they like that. Okay, oh, I see. When talking to disbelievers, they will listen once, twice. How would you overcome that? And, and the person mentions that I work in an all-white environment, and they see talking about Islam as preaching. Mm. Well, maybe my only my guess is that either you think. You think that they think that. Perhaps they don't. In other words, maybe that is your perception. But, or maybe it is just the way that you are doing it. Maybe the way that you do it comes across as preaching. So then you have to find a different way to bring up the subject of Islam without it sounding as if you are preaching to them. Okay? Now, you're going to have to be perhaps a little bit inventive about that. Myself, I'm always looking for opportunities to talk to people about Islam. But you have to, the best way, I'm not saying you have to, but the best way is to try and make it natural, a natural part of the conversation. And sometimes there is no doubt that they don't want to hear it. It's still your job and your duty to convey the message to them in the best way. In the best way. Okay? With good arguments, with good exhortation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran. So you give them a good exhortation and you, you discuss with them in the ways that are best. So this is what you need to uh, develop, this type of technique. Salaamu alaykum. Um, sorry, sorry for that question, just a suggestion. Sure. Um, as well as being like nationally, as uh, well as being with my Muslims who are in Britain, a day for Muslims to call people in the local area of non-Muslim to the Muslim. So that would be a kind of an idea, because I'm sure that there are people who are involved in Muslim society and the accounts who could think about it. And they don't have to do the national day, they can use any day, they can use it once a month or more regularly, whether they go to doors and make believe that it's a 
I mean, I work myself, I work in the Regent's Park Mosque, that's where I work now, in the Regent's Park Mosque and Islamic Cultural Center. We have about 12 to 13,000, 12 to 13,000 school children visiting the mosque every year. Okay, it's actually considered, now it is actually part of the national curriculum, it's, the government is actually encouraging as part of the national curriculum for schools to visit a place of worship. So therefore this is a very excellent idea that mosques should get involved in this program that exists there. They're being encouraged to do it but sometimes they don't know where to go. Okay. If anyone, by the way, here is, is involved in a mosque committee or is involved in a mosque and wants to initiate some program like that, if they get in touch with me, I could send them uh, a small document that I have written called, well, it was originally called A Dummy's Guide to Giving a Guide of the Mosque. But, I mean, basically the idea was, here are the things that you could say to the visitors when they visit the mosque. So it really tells you, it's sort of got almost a script that you could follow. So if anyone's interested in that, I could email it to you. That's a very good idea, and, and uh, there is a lot of demand for that as well. With regard to changing evil, what if you have told, warned and advised believers against major evils with no effect? What is then required of you? Okay, I didn't really want to get into you know, th this issue, but anyway, we can touch upon it briefly. When we are trying to enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong, there are some very important principles that we have to observe. And one of them is to remember that we are trying to increase the amount of good and decrease the amount of evil. We are trying to increase the amount of good and decrease the amount of evil. If the way that we give dawah, if the way that we talk to people, whether it's here Muslims or non-Muslims, if we actually end up pushing a Muslim to do more bad things and the way we talk to them drives them in that direction, then actually we haven't enjoined right and forbidden wrong. We've actually pushed people towards doing more wrong. This is something we have to be very, very careful about. Or sometimes we want to prevent someone from doing something, but we actually find that in doing that, they do something even worse. Anyway, there's a famous incident in the time of uh, Ibn Taymiyyah when his students came across one of the Tatars who was sitting lying drunk. So they said to the Sheikh, shouldn't we prevent him from this? And the Sheikh said, no, leave him. Leave them. Because when they're drunk, they do nothing. They're sleeping. But when they're awake, they kill people. So if, we, if they were prevented them from this thing, it would actually lead them to do something worse. So this is something we have to think about. Especially, this is perhaps in regard to da'wah to Muslims. The da'wah to non-Muslims is something much more simple. It's really telling them about Tawheed. We are, not in, we are not in the realm here of forcing anything upon them. Our duty in terms of giving da'wah to non-Muslims is conveying the message. Fulfilling our duty of conveying the message and explaining to them so they understand. That's our duty. Allah didn't make us responsible for making them Muslim. Allah did make us responsible for conveying the message, however. Just to what said here, the of exhibitions, I don't know if you're aware that there's going to be an Islamic festival which is going to be government banned, I think, basically next year. Mm. I don't know if you're aware of that and do you have any participation in it? And if you have, would you encourage others to participate in it and what sort of participation should they have? I don't know enough about it 
But I mean, generally, if we can participate in anything, in any, in, 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 as long as it's halal, this is the main thing. I mean, there are, of course, some things we might have to be a little bit cautious about. But if you're asking really what I think, I would go to Glastonbury. They have a spiritual, you know, they have a field, a spiritual field. It's one, been one of my aims, and inshallah we'll do it. I'll go to Glastonbury, and I'll go there, and I'll set up a Muslim tent. Inshallah we'll do that in the future. Why not? I used to go down to Speaker's Corner, Leicester Square, which is the center of all the fitna and evil. And the, but who, what's that? The Prophet wasallam used to go to the Kaaba, where they would worship idols and make tawaf naked. Yes, people say, oh, the fitna, the fitna. The Prophet used to go, they made tawaf naked. Naked. The Prophet still went down there and he called the people to Islam. Yes, so really we have quite a wide, you know, spectrum of places and times we can give dawah. Of course, every person has to be a little bit cautious about themselves. You must make sure that if you give dawah, you yourself are not going to end up joining them and doing these bad things, okay? Because this would not be a good, this is not right. Okay, uh, but I think generally, if this festival uh, festival uh, gives you the opportunity to convey the message of Islam, definitely all the brothers and sisters, as much as possible, should get involved, help it. It's a great opportunity without knowing any details about it. So don't please say after it's some horrible, terrible thing. Oh, Abdul Rahim said because I don't know the details about it. So, but generally, yes, we should get involved in those things. Alhamdulillah. Okay, please explain how Islam leads to the vastness of this world. Islam is the vastness of this world. It's in the remembrance of Allah that the hearts find rest. If you want to taste paradise in this life, then the way to do it is by being immersed in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we become the people who love for Allah's sake and hate for Allah's sake. We give for Allah's sake and we withhold for Allah's sake. See how the Prophet ﷺ, he took comfort in the prayer. His comfort was in the prayer. And the Prophet said, of the things of the dunya that I love, he mentioned the prayer as being one of the things of the dunya that he ﷺ loved. And of course, the vastness of this world is also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has directed us to what is halal and kept us away from what is haram. Because the haram things are not forbidden to us, brothers and sisters, because Allah wants to make our life difficult and hard and Allah doesn't want us to enjoy. No. The things that are haram are haram because they are destructive to us spiritually and individually and in terms of community. The haram things destroy the human being. They corrupt us. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden us from those things. It's for our benefit. So Islam itself leads us to the vastness of this world, to what we can enjoy lawfully, to keep us away from those things that are prohibited and therefore dangerous. So this is part of the vastness of this world. Wallahu alim. And please give t- tips on how sisters can give da'wah. Mm. Well, you know, there is a standard response to this. There is a standard response to this, which I don't disagree with it. Is that the best dawah the sisters can do is by raising their children to be good Muslims. No one should belittle the importance of this task. However, of course, this is not merely the limit to how sisters could get involved in dawah. There, there, there is not the limit to it. If the sisters are at university, I find it myself a sort of strange thing that the sisters will go to lectures and they will talk to professors and they will talk to students about the issues concerning their studies. But if it comes to Islam, they they will not talk about these things. Whereas surely the right of Islam is greater. And this is of course as long as we are preventing the doors that lead to you know, fitna and you know, to the uh, free mixing and so on and so forth. Of course, sisters, it is better really many times that sisters could give dawah to non-Muslim women. 
Often when a man is giving dawah to a non-Muslim woman, especially about the issues, for example, come up of women in Islam, it's never going to sound as convincing coming from a man as it is going to sound coming from a Muslim woman. So there are many ways, alhamdulillah, and many doors and avenues, even these exhibitions, especially if they're organized by Muslims, it would be very good if there is some area or some place where the Muslim sisters can be to give dawah to ladies and so on and so forth. So uh, these are all avenues where the sisters could get involved. One more question from the floor. Okay, last question then, from the floor. Yes? No. No? Okay. We have five minutes. Salaam. Wa alaikum where is that? Uh, basically, oh, yeah. I'm just thinking that um, a lot of new Muslims who somewhat isolated when they first joined the community, I think sometimes it's forgotten that Dawa just, just stopped when you convert them. I'm just wondering what your opinion is what Muslims should do to be able to avoid not recently converts being isolated and then to act. Yeah. This is a very big challenge, brothers and sisters. And I b believe, brother, you're a convert, convert to yourself, are you? Recent convert? Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah. So this is a, a call from a brother who himself has recently converted. And I think many of us have experienced this. You know, becoming a Muslim itself is quite a challenge. Just becoming a Muslim, you have to pray five times a day, you have to give up alcohol, you have to, you know, there's many things you're going to have to change about your life that is a very big and radical change for someone who has converted. We don't need another challenge, therefore, of the Muslim community itself being a challenge to us. And this is often what happens. There is the challenge of Islam and then there's the whole challenge of the Muslim community. I, alhamdulillah myself, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me. You know, I married into a really nice family who really welcomed me and treated me so well, mashaAllah. And you know, that really helped me to uh, fit in, you know, and alhamdulillah. Uh, so it wasn't, and even my early friends before that, mashallah, many of them were Moroccans. And so I had a very good friendship and I didn't find it really a problem. But I can understand in certain places, and it seems to be more so when you get up north. I don't, I'm not trying to put the north down or anything like that, you know. But it's true in London is very multicultural. London is much more multicultural. As you move up north, especially if you go to some of those towns a little bit outside of Manchester, there are certain areas where it's almost village life from Pakistan has been transposed to a piece of Yorkshire or Lancashire or whatever. And if someone becomes a Muslim in those communities, it can be very, very, very intimidating, very frightening. Because not only are you now having to adopt Islam, you almost feel compelled to embrace this whole culture. And, and, and very often they're not welcome at all. Not welcome at all. And this goes back to brothers and sisters, we have to change our mentality as Muslims. We have to be dawah orientated. I really believe, brothers and sisters, that dawah should be so natural to us that just like we think it's dhuhr time, I have to pray, it's fajr, I have to get up, we should be thinking about dawah almost like that. There is a non-Muslim, this guy's been sitting next to me for 10 minutes. Maybe Allah will ask me why I didn't tell that person something about Islam. So I used to, I mean, I probably not like that anymore. Because you know, sometimes your enthusiasm it goes up and down. And, but I remember when I first became Muslim, if I sat on the tube in London, I mean, I'm sitting on the tube. Believe me, the tube is the most, people just sit there and totally ignore each other. Sit in the newspaper and this and that and you know, whatever. But I would feel... I'm sitting on a whole tube journey next to someone and I haven't told them anything about Islam. Maybe Allah will ask me, how come? Maybe. And that's the sort of feeling I had about the need to give dawah. And I'm not saying it has to be that extreme, but we should have that mentality. Okay, at least someone's lived next to you, your next door neighbor, for a year, for two or three months. Do they know about Islam? Your neighbor, your work colleagues. 
Do they know about Islam? So brothers and sisters, this is the type of mentality. If we get that mentality, when people become Muslim, already our way of thinking is going to, we, is going to change. And that's where it has to start. It has to start from a different way of thinking. A diff and it's happening. Alhamdulillah, definitely in London, I've seen a huge change in the mentality of Muslims. And it's actually got a lot to do with what happened on 9-11. A lot of Muslims started realizing that we can't live as ghettoized, isolated communities. We're going to have to go out and tell these people what Islam is about. Because if they don't, they're going to be frightened of us. They're going to think this and they're going to think that. So we've been forced to come out of our shell. And it's had many... Uh, and this is not to say that it was a good thing what happened, but sometimes out of something bad, something good can happen. And I've noticed, this is at least in London I've noticed, that there is a, a, a quantum leap in improvement in these things. So, sorry brother, you're living in Manchester and, you know, these developments are happening in London. But inshallah, you know, uh, I don't know about Manchester, but inshallah I'm sure that this mentality, especially if you and me today, not tomorrow, not next week, Today, we take it upon ourselves to start acting upon this knowledge, changing our mentality, changing our way of thinking, changing our behavior in accordance with it. Okay, and then, you know, I think this issue of accommodating people who have converted to Islam is something that is going to hopefully develop. You know, just as a side point, by the way, in the Islamic Cultural Center, Regents Park Mosque, we are trying to do something, one of the things we do, we have an Islamic Fundamentals study course which is teaching in one year there are four weekends of intensive lectures. So it's a bit like this, really, what's happening here, except it happens in the ICC and the Islamic Conference and it's really for about 70 people only. But those four weekends aim to give the person the basics of Islam. The other good thing is you'll meet other new Muslims there and stuff like that. So brother, you know, uh, hopefully you could get in, I mean maybe it's a long way, you know, London to Manchester, but they are, alhamdulillah, very, very well received and it's a good atmosphere to meet other new Muslims. Uh, so that's one of the developments yeah, taking place. Alhamdulillah. How would you start a discussion about Islam with a non-Muslim? Give me any subjects. Give me any subject you like. I mean I could actually chat. If we had a little seminar or a workshop we could do this. I challenge you to give me any subject, and I believe if I really wanted to, within three or four sentences, going back and forward, I could bring the subject of Islam up. I knew you'd say football. So, straight away, you know, the way some people support football teams, it seems to me it's almost like a religion. Needlework. There you go, needlework. Oh, great. Well, we could talk about the wool. Where does the wool come from? Isn't it amazing that there is this creature on the earth that has this skin and this... Oh, here I'm going to get caught. But I mean, you get the idea, okay? You can say, isn't that amazing? And we have so many animals and we have so many things. And could this be a product of chance and coincidence? Some, just some random event? Or is this evidence of... I mean, I'm making it very simple here, but evidence of a bountiful creator. There's an avenue in everything. Anything a person can mention, if you want, you can make it an avenue to give down. I remember once, just to think that I was... Going on a talk, I stopped off in the new forest, uh, took the kids for a walk, and there were some people bird watching. So I just stopped to this man, and he'd been looking at these birds for hours, and I said to him, did you ever think about these birds, their wings and their feathers, how intricate and how amazing the design of that bird is? You know what he said to me? He said, no, I, I never really thought about that. I said, you've been watching birds for how many years? 20 years? I said, you've never thought about the aerodynamics, about how such a thing could possibly fly? Doesn't it make you think that maybe there's some design behind all of this? And he sort of looked. And I said, anyway, you think about it, and that's it. 
I mean, I just saw him, I talked to him, and I went. I left him with something. That's how dawah should be. You don't have to say, Islam, Muhammad, Quran, here, this and that. Sometimes it's just a thought. You know, really a lot of the time, brothers and sisters, we just need to get people's brains engaged, to point them in the right direction. It's a start. I don't, when I say dawah, I don't mean that's it, we're trying to give them all of Islam in one go. Maybe the, the person who asked the question about, I work with white colleagues, think I'm preaching. Because maybe that's the way you're talking. It's like Islam, bada, ba bum, ba bum, you know, Quran. No. I mean, sometimes when I'm talking about dawah, we have to even start getting them thinking about the idea that there is a God, that there is a Creator. Re establishing that idea in their hearts and minds. This is the beginning of it, yes? That's where it starts. So, uh, there you go, inshallah. I think that will.